everybody for joining us um, for a special summer session of EI Live uh, K-12. Um, my name is Cassie and I work um, at the Earth Institute and I work in education and outreach and a big part of my job is to bring our science um, to new audiences, including students, parents, and teachers. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding um, of the science behind the climate crisis and what we as global citizens can do. Um, experts that make up the Earth Institute um, include earth scientists, economists, uh, business and policy experts, um, and specialists in public health and law. Um, the Earth Institute is actually made up of two dozen or so research centers um, and uh, several hundred people who work across many different disciplines and departments um, at Columbia. Um, and today we're super, super lucky to have Laurel Zaima and Margie Turin um, start us off um, in a sort of three part series. Um, there are two additional sessions tomorrow and Wednesday at this uh, exact time um, for different age uh, groups and audiences. If you have only signed up for this one but would like to learn a little bit more about the others, um, don't hesitate to shoot us an email or Laurel and Margie, if you also want to comment on the Tuesday and Wednesday sessions, um, that would be great. Um, so today they're going to talk to us about fish in the Hudson. Um, they're going to be utilizing polls and breakout rooms um, throughout the session and we'll definitely be monitoring questions um, as many of you have already done um, using that we're going to use the chat box for questions. Um, if they're presenting and you uh, have a question feel free to jot it down in there um, and then what we'll do is at the end there will be time for questions and discussions and we encourage you to turn on your microphones and uh, turn on your cameras so we can see you um, and we're recording this so that you can uh, we'll be able to share a link with everybody afterwards in case you want to come back and, and uh, rewatch this or if you have to hop off early. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to Laurel and Margie. Thank you for that introduction, Cassie. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so right from the get-go, I wanted you guys to go to this link or scan the QR code to put in the first three words that come to mind when you think about fish. We have about, we have nine responses. So I can share what I can see right now. I know there's 19 participants, so if you want to hurry and put your last, um, last entries in, feel free to do that. The link is also in the chat. So maybe we can introduce ourselves and then we'll pop it up and that will give them time to actually get that in. Does that sound good? Perfect. Can you put okay. the link? in one more time. I think that it didn't go through if you came in late. Ah, okay. Good point. Meeting. So Laurel is pop, pop that in. Um, so today uh, we are going to spend a little bit of time with you and introduce ourselves so that you know who you're talking with. Uh, my name is Margie Turin and I'm Director of Educational Field Programs at Lamont and um, have been at Lamont for a number of years and focus on a lot on the Hudson River, but also um, a little bit further afield in polar regions with climate uh, focus. And Laurel? Uh, hi everyone, my name is Laurel Zyma. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Lamont. Um, my background is marine biology, so before I started working at Columbia, um, just about two years ago, I was actually um, studying and working in Florida. So I'm really excited about today, fish, are one of my favorite topics, so we're going to have a lot of fun. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing so you can share your screen. Perfect. Oh, we have some last minute additions. Okay, so if everyone can see my screen, this is an amazing, um, for those of you who are educators out there, this is an amazing tool called Mentimeter. Um, for this purpose, we are using a word cloud. So you can see it's morphing <laughs> as we're going, which is really fun. Um, but the bigger the word, that means more people had put that entry in. So to no surprise, water is the biggest word when it, you're thinking about fish. But you know, I was also looking at some of these that were really popping to me and I was really um, impressed by some of the things in here, like gender swapping, breathe oxygen, um, scales is another big one. Um, lunch, which 
maybe someone's <laughs> eating fish for lunch today. <laughs> um, plentiful, underwater, shiny, oceans, migration. I mean, there are just so many great words in here. Um, so this is a fun tool that Margie and I like to use for um, a pre, and then we'll do it at the very end as a post. So thank you all for doing this with us. Um, we'll ensure to save that and we can share it at the end as well. Okay, um, so we're gonna start with our first poll, Nina. Oh, that's actually me. You. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, so what is your role? Just a couple more people, three more people. <laughs> All right. Two more people want to answer? I'll give you five more seconds. Okay. Can everyone see the results? So actually the majority of attendees today are subject specialists. Um, we have formal and informal educators um, and students. We have a, a fair bit of students here. So welcome everyone, we're so happy to have you. Okay, so um, in non-virtual world, Margie and I spend a lot of time at the Hudson River Field Station, which is located just about five miles away from our home base of Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory. It's located right here at the end of Piermont Pier, um, so we have amazing access to the Hudson River. Um, we're zooming in right now because this field station is actually pretty newly renovated within, um, it was opened its doors for the first time last summer, but there had been a lot of work being done there. Um, years prior, just open to the public for the first time last summer. So we're really excited about it. Um, I also just wanted to show you where we go seining, which is a form of fishing. So right here on this rocky type beach, um, walks down into a sandy area. That's where we like to go catch our fish. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. You can see the pier is actually pretty long. It's about a mile long. That kind of juts right out almost halfway to the middle of the Hudson here, which is the widest section of the Hudson River. We are also very close to the Tappan Zee or Mario Cuomo Bridge. Um, so you can actually see that when you're standing on the end of the pier. And we're also just north of the Piermont Marsh. So this is the largest salt, saltwater tidal marsh on the Hudson River. So this um, huge important marsh definitely has a impactful role on the biology that we see when we are fishing <coughs> here as well as the water quality. And just for reference, this, when we're not at the pier, we're at Lamont most days, which is um, located right there in Palisades, New York. And if we zoom out even further, you can also see that we're not too far away from New York City, so we definitely have the urban influence. Um, New York is about 30 miles away from us, from Lamont, um, so I just wanted to give you some spatial reference there as well. And of course, if we zoom out even farther, you can see that we're also very close. If we're close to New York, we're close to the, the New York Harbor. So we're very close to the Atlantic, which has a um, influence on where we are at the pier as well. So that's just giving you guys a little bit of uh, geographical background. All right, jumping right into our second poll. Um, we want to know what you think defines a fish. This is a multiple answer, so feel free to answer as many as you see fit. Yes, Vanessa, to answer your question, we love having school groups of all ages come visit us at the pier to do field work with us. Um, and so 
when things start opening up and, and students are able to go on these field investigations again, we would love to host you all. And we'll talk more about that at the end. All right, five more people that we're waiting on. All right. So if everyone can see the poll results, 100% um, of the attendees here think that gills define a fish. We have 94% fins and then the others are are more towards 59 and 71 percent with water eggs tails scales all right thank you guys so the reason why we ask is because we have a fun game right here um, of what defines a fish so remember your answers we have them recorded in our poll um, the first thing that we would be looking at, do you think water defines a fish? And the answer is yes, absolutely. So if you had chosen water, you are absolutely correct. All fish live in fresh or salty water and they have special adaptations to do so. However, there are some interesting outlier fish. So for example, the lung fish um, has a special adaptation with um, these additional uh, organs like this uh, specialized lung because they live in oxygen depleted environments. Um, however, if Margie clicks one more time, the, nothing compares to this mangrove killifish that is extremely hardy. So this mangrove killifish can actually live out of water for a consecutive 66 days without actually having to drop its metabolic activity too much, which is very impressive. Um, killifish are extremely hardy. Um, we have killifish in the Hudson as well, not this type of killifish, but um, that is something that we see among the killies is that they are, they're extremely hardy fish. Um, and he has to live in water, but 66 days without water is pretty impressive. All right, and two, gills. If you said gills, and I think actually 100% of the people said gills, you are absolutely correct. Great job. So. While fish don't breathe air, they do need oxygen and they obtain their oxygen through their gills. So they have to have um, oxygenated water flowing through their mouth and out their gills and their gills are able to extract that dissolved oxygen in the water. So this is an important feature um, to help fish to breathe. Um, and again, we kind of talked about, you know, fish, they can live outside the water like the killifish can live outside the water for 66 days and they have special adaptations to do that. The lungfish have those specialized lungs to be able to do that as well. Um, so if Margie pops up, perfect. That is what a lungfish looks like. Looks crazy, almost prehistoric. Um, because they can live in really oxygen depleted environments, they have the special lung adaptation as well as gills. So all fish have gills, um, but not all animals that have gills are fish. What about scales? I know a handful of people thought that scales were a um, defining feature of a fish. However, it's not actually true. Not all fish have scales. Well, some of, most of them do. There are some uh, species of fish that actually live in the Hudson River that don't. So, for example, click. Perfect. White catfish, they do not have scales. They have this, um, mucus covered skin that helps to protect them. And um, this naked goby right here also do not have scale scales. And I'm seeing in the chat, Yana said sharks don't have scales. Sharks are interesting. They actually do have scales, but they're called dermal denticles. They're a specialized um, tooth. So it's like skin teeth that kind of lay over each other. Um, it helps them to swim extremely fast in the water as predators, of course, and prevents like algae and things from gr growing on them. So it's not like a, a typical scale that you would think of, but they do have a specialized type of scales. Yep. Dermal denticles. Perfect. That's how you spell it. All right. What about fins? I think a fair 
amount of you had said that fish need fins. Correct. So all fish, they're swimming through the water and they need the fins to help them do that. Um, however, not all fish have the same type of fins. So if Margie pops this picture up here, perfect. Um, these are the fins that we're gonna be talking about today. Dorsal, whenever we're talking about the dorsal, we're talking about the top of the fish. The ventral is the bottom side of the fish. Um, there are fins on both the dorsal side and the ventral side. So, but not all fish have two dorsal fins. Some do, some don't. And we're gonna look more at some different types of species that have it and don't. Um, there are also pelvic fins on the ventral side, an anal fin on the ventral side, pectoral fins kind of help them uh, move through the water and those are located on the sides of the fish. And then the caudal fin or the tail at the very end. All right, number five, do all fish lay eggs? That's actually not, not all fish lay eggs. Um, so there are different reproductive strategies that fish can use, which is pretty interesting. Most of them lay eggs, which is called oviparous. Um, that's the scientific name for it. Um, some fish actually give live birth, which is called viviparous. And then some very special species of fish, they actually have um, the fish in an egg inside of their bodies. And then, um, they give birth into the environment. So instead of being, in, um, being connected to like a placenta, they are connected to a yolk sac and then they are birthed. So that's called ovoviviparis. But all of our Hudson River fish, they lay eggs. So we're gonna be focusing on those guys today. And this is a crazy image of sturgeon eggs. Um, sturgeon, uh, their eggs are, were very valuable. They're endangered now, so you cannot fish surgeon for their eggs, but um, this was an extremely valuable form of food in the Hudson. It was called black gold back in the day. And last but not least, tails. So Laura, you have a question before okay. you move on from Yanis. Um, so she was asking, isn't the yolk sac like a type of egg? Yes, exactly. So that's why if you, if you can actually look at the, the names of these words, it's Ovo VV Paris is kind of like a mix between VV Paris, live birth, and OV Paris, which is egg laying. So it is kind of like a mix between both of those, which is kind of odd. So it means that um, instead of being in a uterus, like a live birth would be, um, these animals are actually in an egg inside of the mother. And when they're birthed, they're, they're given live birth. But there is like an egg instead of a like placenta connected like what a mammal would have. So a little bit confusing, but it is like a mix of both. You're absolutely right. And oops, last one is our tails. Do fish have tails? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, all fish have tails, but not all the fish tails look the same. And I'm sure you can even think of some fish in your head right now. And if you really think about it, oh yeah, some have forked tails, some have rounded tails. And if Margie clicks to the next um, thing, then we can see, yep, perfect. All these different types of tails actually help that species of fish to move throughout the water in the way that it was um, fit into its environment. For example, if, if a fish has a, a more rounded tail, um, like some of our smaller killifish or mummy chugs. They are really good at bursts of speed and maneuverability, maybe to get away from a predator. But if you're thinking about more of our open ocean type of fish, like a tuna or a sailfish, they create more and more of a crescent type of tail, which helps them with long distance migrations. They can have really fast speeds, but if they need to turn, they are not very good at turning on a dime like some of the other more rounded tails are. So all fish have tails, but they all look different. <laughs> all right, this is a fun game just to kind of get your students thinking about um, what defines a fish in comparison to other animals. Um, you could also, if, so this is an online version, but you could also, if you are in the classroom with students or if they're coming to visit you as informal educators, um, you could print this and it could be a matching game where they guess and then they can lift up the pieces to see which one is correct and not. Um, Perfect. All right. <laughs> now we're going to take a deep dive into fish anatomy. So um, 
I'm going to, yeah, perfect, Margie. So I think it's important for students to understand that, um, you know, some, that fish have some similarities with humans, such as brains, eyes, nostrils, heart, liver, intestines, et cetera. However, there are a lot of features of a fish anatomy that humans don't have because they have to live in this aquatic environment. So I have um, this fish model. It's a great tool. It's something that we purchased from Carolina Biologic, but if you don't have access to this, there are tons of visual images that you could use a guessing game on as well. Uh, but for the sake of this um, PD, Margie, maybe you could stop sharing your screen. It's just gonna ask you if you needed that list. Okay. And I'm going to, I just realized it's a little dark in here, so brighten it up for everyone. Okay, so what we're looking at is a fish. And so this is kind of like a substitute fish dissection, much less messy, le much less smelly as well. Um, so some things you can point out right away. These fish have mouths, just like humans do. Eyes, they also have these little nostrils here as well. Some things to point out on the fish. Um, if you were to open up this fish, you can also see they have a brain, maybe a smaller brain than ours, but they do have a brain. And if you pull off their gills for a moment, you can also see that they have a heart. So they have a lot of the similarities that humans do. However, to help them breathe in their environment, they have these amazing gills. And just in this uh, model right here, you can see that the gills are bright red. And that's actually how gills look in real life with a fish. They are covered in blood vessels. And if you look, I'm gonna pop this off so you guys can get, take a really close look. Um, even in this model, you can see it's feathered, which increases the surface area because the more oxygenated water that's flowing through these gills, um, through this large surface area, it allows that animal to be able to take up more and more dissolved oxygen from their environment, which then they can um, send through these blood vessels, which is why it's so red, throughout the rest of their body to help fuel them, which is so important. And remember, I said at the very beginning that the way that fish are getting, is, they're getting this water through their gills is by having their mouth open. So let me put the face back on our fish here. You can see his mouth is open. As they swim, it helps that water goes in through their mouth and out through their gills. And so one way to prevent, cause you know, the water is a crazy place. What if a fish got stuck in his mouth as he was just swimming along? and it all of a sudden went shooting through the gills with the rest of the water. They have this amazing adaptation called gill rakers. Um, it kind of looks like these spikes and it helps to prevent any creatures or animals or food that they're trying to eat from exiting through their gills. Instead, it will go straight down into their stomach. Um, so gill rakers and gills to help these fish. Um, some other really amazing things. Um, I'm not having to go too deep into the internal anatomy of the fish because that's probably a little bit more than your students um, need to go into. But one amazing adaptation that fish have um, is called a swim bladder, also referred to as a gas bladder sometimes. Now this swim bladder, they're able to fill with a little bit of air, which helps them maintain neutral buoyancy. So any scuba divers out there, uh, it's so important to get neutral buoyancy so you don't exert so much energy swimming up a little bit, swimming down a little bit to maintain that area in the water column that you're trying to achieve. And the same goes for fish. So they kind of use this um, to help them maintain that area in the water column that they're swimming so they don't have to waste their energy. Um, okay, and the last thing I wanted to point out on our beautiful model here are the fins. So we talked about dorsal fins on the top of the fish. The first set of dorsal fins, if the fish has it, are spiky and they're called spines. Um, fish have this, it's an amazing adaptation, um, especially when they're feeling threatened, maybe by a predator, they'll flare their spines up and it is, um, it kind of deters the predator from wanting to eat them because it looks sharp. Um, the back dorsal, little softer, don't have these spiky spines, so these are called rays. Spines and rays on the dorsal fins here. Um, on the ventral side, we have the pelvic fin. So, yep, I do see like, aren't humans originally fish? Yeah, so there's this amazing book um, talking about the fish in us, talking about the evolution of fish um, coming on land. It's incredible. So yes, just like we have pelvic bone, they have a pelvic fin here. 
and then an anal fin, which is close to their anus, also on the ventral side. And then we call this the caudal fin, but it's also referred to as the tail. We said fish, all, all fish have tails, just different shapes and sizes. And last but not least, on the other side of our fish, we can see its pectoral fin, which is, I always kind of talk about them as like the airplane wings <laughs> of the fish fin. Um, perfect. So this is an amazing tool. It's an amazing model, especially if you don't have access to a real live fish dissection. Um, but I know that not everyone has access to these models. So um, if Margie pops up our PowerPoint again, there's an, a lot of amazing um, images that show fish internal and external anatomy. Um, you could pull this up with your students and have that you could kind of blank out some of these and have them label what the different parts of the fish are as well. And again, this, this specific picture is probably a little bit too advanced, but you can choose which um, different features of the fish you would like your students to identify. All right. So let me put that down. Okay, and we can go on to the next slide. Um, so we didn't go into too much detail about fish mouths, but just like other features of the fish, their mouths are different shapes and sizes to help fit um, the role that they play in the ecosystem. So we have our long skinny type bill mouth um, helps this fish to poke into crevices. In the Hudson, we have something called a pipe fish. So on the upper right hand corner, you can see this pipe fish is this long, almost looks like a seahorse if you had like straightened them out. Um, but they have that long tube like mouth and it helps them to kind of poke around and gather their food that way. Um, we also, we have a seahorse in the Hudson as well, um, and they are a relative to the, the northern pipefish. We also have fish with large mouths, so these would be really our predators, right? Um, one of the biggest predators in the Hudson are the striped bass. Um, this is just an amazing picture that I found of how big that bass's mouth can be, and they just gulp up a bunch of the, its prey. Um, so these striped bass Definitely one of the biggest predators out here in the Hudson. Um, surprisingly, we have fish that have kind of beak-like mouths. Um, this is a puffer fish, which we have in the Hudson as well, northern puffer. These guys have a little beak and they use that beak to extract the shellfish from the shells. Sometimes they even use their beak to break the shells in order to get their food. Um, we have fish that are benthic, benthic meaning bottom. So they kind of reside on the bottom of the river estuary. Um, so that means that their mouth is gonna be facing towards the bottom because they like to eat different things out of the sand and sediment. So this is our sturgeon. They have bottom facing mouths to then gather food from the bottom of the river. And finally, upward oriented mouths. So this is kind a little counterintuitive, but an upward facing mouth kind of looks like a frowny face. But when the fish opens its mouth, you can see that they're gathering food from the surface. So any fish that has an upward oriented mouth, you can tell that they like to kind of reside toward the surface. So a lot of our killifish um, have that. And you can see this little banded killifish on the bottom right here. You can see just its little frowny face kind of. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> All that animation comes in later. Okay, um, so one thing about, remember, benthic bottom, our benthic fish, they have an extra sensory organ that helps them to detect the food out of the sediments and sand. Um, they're called barbells. So if you look really closely on the sturgeon, you can see these little barbells, kind of looks like a whisker mustache. Um, you can also think like catfish, they're known to have these barbells. I mean, their name is catfish because they have these crazy barbells. Um, so these sensory organs, they actually house the taste buds and they help to sense the food out of the bottom. So um, this is also just a really great look of how the mouths are really on the bottom of these type of benthic creatures. So not all fish have barbells, but the, what, if you do see a fish with barbells, it's a pretty good indicator that they eat off the bottom. Atlantic sturgeon. Short-nosed sturgeon, we have both of those in the Hudson, channel catfish and white catfish. And our channel catfish, they are actually an invasive species. So I think that's why in this picture they have the white, which is native, and the channel, which is invasive next to each other. Although both of our Atlantic sturgeon, they live in the Hudson and they're native. 
All right, coloration of the fish. Um, this is fun and I'm sure your students are familiar with this um, already, but we have some fish that are camouflaging with their environment and the, that's a lot of our flat fish. So this is a window pane. You can almost barely see this fish because it's so well camouflaged with its uh, sandy environment. They also even can sometimes bury themselves in the sand, which makes it even harder to find them. We also have disruptive coloration, which is kind of unique because if you were thinking about a fish with stripes and dots, you would think that it would almost make them stand out to predators, but it's actually a form of camouflage because this coloration makes it really hard for a predator to see where the fish starts and stops. Um, so it kind of like breaks up the outline of the fish. Counter shading, and this isn't just Hudson River fish. It's not just predators, it's not just prey. This is something that we see a lot. Um, it basically means that the dark of the, the top of the fish, the dorsal, is darker, and the ventral side or the belly side is lighter. And the reason for that is, is if you're looking down on this fish that has counter shading, their dark dorsal kind of blends in with the bottom of the water, that deep, dark ocean or river or estuary. Can't really see them that well. And if you're on the bottom looking up from this fish, they blend in with the bright surface of the water. Um, so counter shading is something that you see on tons of fish. And now that I've brought it up, you probably have been like, oh, I didn't even realize there's a name for that. Um, but it's very common. And then last but not least, but the eye spot or the false eye, you can see that little dot near the tail of this spot tail shiner. Um, it actually confuses predators to make them think that their face is their tail. So if their predator goes for their tail, then they can swim off going forward and kind of get away. So another form of camouflage. And we, we touched on the swim bladder in our fish anatomy. I just wanted to show you a close-up picture of this swim bladder. Kind of extends um, like in an elongated way throughout the fish's body to help them with their buoyancy. So just to show what it looks like in real life, it's pretty interesting. Maria, you can click again. <laughs> oh, great. This is one that was unfortunately not on my fish model, but is such an amazing adaptation that fish have for living in this aquatic environment. And it's called the lateral line. So it is a line of kind of like pores along the fish's body. Um, they allow water to come into these little pores and the vibrations of the water um, kind of like tickle this sensory hair and tell the fish that there is another creature or something that's making movement either on their left side or their right side. So if you ever see a school of fish and you're like, how in the world are they not bumping into each other all the time? It's because they have these lateral lines to tell them where the, the fish next to them is. So it kind of helps them to detect their schooling fish, their predators, or even their prey. So this is a pretty amazing adaptation that fish have just by living in the aquatic environment that we wouldn't have. And to see what this looks like in real life, um, I have these two cool pictures of white perch. Um, so these are pictures from the Hudson as well. This is on the left-hand side, it's an adult white perch and you can kind of just see that lateral line stretching along the body. Um, and then on the juvenile, I wanted to show this because it's even more clear. You can see that line like going straight across the body there. So that helps them to, to detect vibrations and movement throughout the water on their sides. We have a couple of questions, Laurel. So I thought maybe we could spend a second and just answer some of them. So Jody asked, are swim bladders um, bony? Wait, found in bony and cartilage. Cartilage. Cartilage in Sorry. fish? <laughs> I'm oh. sorry, my, my screen is going back and forth and so I'm trying to get the words out. But anyway, yes. Um, great question. Yes, not all fish have swim bladders. That's a really good point. Um, that's why not included into our what defines a fish. Bony fish have swim bladders. Um, cartilaginous fish like our sharks, they actually don't need a swim bladder because they have this huge oily liver. Um, and you can kind of explain this to students like if you've ever put oil in water, what happens to the oil? Like goes to the surface. So this big oily liver that they have also helps to kind of maintain their buoyancy. They don't need the swim bladder because they don't have the heavy bones that any of those bony fish have. Great question. 
what is the average size of an average fish? That is a <laughs> question that would depend on the species. So every single fish, different shapes, sizes. I mean, we have the tiniest fish um, to, you know, the biggest fish in the world, which is our whale shark. So um, I think if you're looking at average size, you have to think about the species. You have to think about whether you're talking about juveniles or adults. Um, and, then, and then you can kind of look at a series of data to figure out what the average would be. But yeah, that's a good point just to say, you know, fish are all different sizes. Um, what is the physiology of the lateral line sensing? Is it also electrical or magnetic? Um, lateral line is not, but there are some adaptations that certain fish have that do sense um, electromagnetic energy in the water. Um, those would be, I'm thinking sharks. So I, so really focus my studies on sharks. So that's why I keep thinking shark related things. But um, the lateral line, and if we wanna go back one, I can show you um, kind of the physiology of it. Probably a little bit more in depth than your um, elementary school students would, would want, but just for your understanding, they have these little pores um, that allow water to come in. And so whenever there's like, a vibration in the water, any water movement, that water is going to displace within these pores into this like internal canal. Um, it kind of, and then if you look at the image that's labeled C, you can see that that water movement kind of displaces these sensory hairs, which then can send that nervous system, that nervous signal um, to the fish. So then it kind of um, unconsciously knows that there is another creature next to it or near it on its left or right side. There was one other question about whether upward um, facing mouth fish are safer to eat than fish that have downward facing mouths, I'm assuming more bottom feeders. Oh, wow. That's a really great question. So um, specifically in the Hudson, um, our toxicity challenges are going farther back um, to when we had been, you know, large industrial um, plants were, were producing PCBs. And that, that's our big challenge right now. It's this historic challenge that unfortunately has stayed with us, even though we're not contributing toward that pollution today. But PCBs are, um, it's a chemical polychlorinated by phenols. They're very stable, unfortunately, and they bind to sediments. So yes, like this type of toxic chemical that's binding to sediments would then make benthic fish dangerous to eat. So that's why you cannot eat catfish in the Hudson. Um, and if you're also, but it doesn't necessarily limit to bottom feeders. If you think about biomagnification, so the top predators in the Hudson, such as our striped bass, they're also dangerous to eat if, um, so you can only eat them once per month if you are a man over 15 years old or a woman over 50 years old. So there are these very specialized rules for which fish you can and cannot eat because of um, this contamination, but also like the species, the fish, how they live, who you are, where you are, where you're fishing. So um, that's a great question. I encourage you to go onto the Hudson River Fish Advisory website for more details on that. Okay, and I think this is our last one. Just to go into a little bit more detail of the gills, um, I think this is a great image just to see that like feathery surface that really increases the surface area, um, that really red bright color showing you that there's tons of blood vessels to um, extract that dissolved oxygen from the water, send it throughout the rest of its body. So in this image, it pretty nicely um, shows how that oxygenated water flowing through the mouth of the fish and then flushing over the gills for them to be able to um, get that oxygen out of the water. And then of course, like animals, they're releasing CO2. All right. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. So that's uh, a little bit of background on fish. And now we thought we would do a couple of activities that you can do with your students. You can um, take them apart, do different pieces of them, um, but they are based on real data that was collected as part of a master's workshop that we ran uh, for our Day in the Life of the Hudson and Harbor project. And so we put it together as, as just an opportunity to uh, let 
students look at data and try and pose some questions around it. So we're going to start back in this wonderful June sunny day where a group met on the Hudson and we were really interested in seeing the diversity of fish that lived in the water. And so the group decided to travel to three different places and you'll see that they're noted here on the map. So here's place number one, place number two, place number three. But while we were standing there, one of the participants asked, well, why should we spend time going to three different places on the Hudson? It's all the same river. Won't the fish be the same everywhere? And traveling's gonna take a lot of time, so maybe if we just spent our time at one location and collected multiple samples, we would do just as well. So, uh, who wants to pop some, some thoughts in the chat as to whether we should just do multiple sampling at one location or should we spend the time and go to three different places and perhaps not have as much time to collect as many samples in a spot. And we'll wait just a minute for people to pop in and uh, see what they have to say. Thoughts on this. Anybody have thoughts? Ah, okay. All right, so I vote three sites because water salinity changes as you move away from the Atlantic. So there's somebody that knows something about the Hudson. The habitats may be different at the different sites. Amount of uh, submerged aquatic plants, so SAVs. Marshes nearby, industry will affect diversity. More places will give you a better picture of the river. Collect from a wider, whoops, everything's flying here <laughs> from different spots to see a wider variety of species. Um, and more sites would allow us to see how the environment changes and fish may too. Great, so I'm, um, I think this might be a really great question to ask your students and we'll see what their thoughts are and how they would vote for it. Um, I think it's just a good way of getting them to think about what might be the advantages of how you set up your study sample. So again, we want to encourage our students to think as a scientist, be a scientist, and how would we set up our study? Um, so we just answered that question um, and we'll move on to the next which is just digging a little bit more into the Hudson so now that we've had a first blush at things now we can think about more this particular uh, river so the lower half of this river which is 153 miles is actually not just a river it's an estuary and so an estuary is where this fresh water meets with salt ocean salty ocean water and we have the influence of tides and salt water that affect the river um, we can see down here at the bottom of the screen where the Atlantic Ocean um, is meeting with the base of our Hudson or the mouth, depending on how you refer to it, we would call that the mouth. Um, and the salt in the ocean, of course, is 35 parts per thousand. Um, and all three of these sites are in this lower part of the estuary. So will these fish differ in those few miles? And we won't know unless we actually go forward and do a little sampling. So that's in fact what we're going to do. We have a chance to pose a question and answer it through data. All right, so we are going to sample fish and our method is one called seining. Um, this is John Waldman who's from Queens College. He's an ichthyologist so he studies fish. Um, he was there to kind of guide us through the day and um, spent a little time talking about the very specific needs and wants of the different fish. So this is a seine net here on the right. I know some of you have gone seining before because I recognize your names and it sounds as if you're all a fairly um, educated group. You have some experience, um, but just to kind of talk it through so everybody's on the same page. A seining started with the Native American population. They used to build these nets out of reeds. They would weave them together and they would put sticks on the end and pull the net through the water. So the idea is that you walk through the water with the net dragging behind you and it just captures the fish in front of it that all kind of collect or guided towards the middle of the net. Some nets have pockets where they um, hold the fish even better, others don't. Um, with the idea of then you bring it into shore, you look through what's there. Um, we do it just for doing uh, species identification, and then we would pop the fish back into the river so we don't actually hold on to them. And we'll watch a group of students doing some seining, just so you get a sense of what it's like to move 
a net through the water. You can see uh, it's a little bit of a slow movement. So there is a, a little bit of physics running against you with the current as you pull through the water. Uh, you can also see by the movement of the students here, this nice sediment plume that's following behind their feet. So the Hudson can be fairly sedimenty, very soft sediment, and it, it can make that uh, seining a little bit slow. But it's really a great way of collecting a diversity of, of fish. Okay, so along with the fish that we're gonna collect in our net, we're also interested in a few other variables because they tell us a little bit about why we're getting the fish that we get. So it's not enough to just pull the fish into the net. We wanna understand the data that's around them, so their environment. And one of the first things that we're interested in is what's the salt. So how much salt is in the water where we're sampling? Some fish like really salty water, so they like almost a marine environment. Those would be the ones that are uh, down towards the harbor and out uh, the mouth of the Hudson. Some like a little bit of salt, so that's more of a mix of the fresh and salt, and that's called brackish. And then some of our Hudson estuary fish are actually freshwater fish. So we have all of those going on in our system. We were also interested in how much oxygen was in the water for the fish. So um, there is dissolved oxygen in the water. This is not the oxygen that's in H2O in the water molecule itself. It's oxygen that sits between those water molecules and is available for the fish um, to breathe. And a healthy dissolved oxygen for most of our fish, fish species is around five to 11 parts per million or milligrams per liter. Um, and Laurel already mentioned one fish that in the Hudson that's much more tolerant than that, and those would be our killifish. But uh, for the most part, they're really interested in that five to 11 parts per million. And then we're interested in water temperature. Um, and again, different species have different water temperature requirements. Um, and in addition to that, colder water holds more oxygen. So when we get into these very high temperatures, we, send, we tend to see uh, some of our fish get stressed in fact, some of you might have noticed um, this last month, there were a lot of, um, if you live along the Hudson, you might have noticed this, there were fish that were dying. And it was because our water temperatures got very, very warm. They were stressed for uh, the amount of oxygen that was available. And some of our fish are less tolerant. They're much more um, susceptible to this. Herring is one, and the Atlantic menhaden, which is one of our herring species, is uh, the fish that really seem to take the brunt of this. And then the last thing that we're interested in doing is collecting information about the environment that we're seining in. So some of our sites are marshy, others have different types of plants in them, um, some that are a benefit adding oxygen into the water, some that are a problem where they sit on top of the water and pop oxygen into the air. So there are all kinds of different um, environments that are, have an effect on what fish we see. So our first stop is going to be in Yonkers. It's River Mile 18, um, which is um, the BZAC site. And so I've circled our first stop down here on the map. And we're looking at uh, the environment in these two images. And you should notice that there's a small marsh behind us. So there's a marsh off to one edge of BZAC, and then there's this kind of sandy bottom along their shoreline. Um, the marsh definitely will have an effect on the environment. And um, there are some of our fish that really like that marshy condition. One example is the mama chug, which is also called a mud minnow. And that's one of our killifish. Um, they really thrive in a marshy environment. Flounder also like marsh um, and black drum. So there are several species that are really interested in um, a marshy setting. Um, okay, so um, I have put together a little uh, chart of what we, what we collected in terms of our uh, water conditions. Our salinity was 8.1 parts per thousand, which is about one quarter that of full ocean. So that means that it's brackish, so it's not full marine. It's kind of got that mix of uh, salty and fresh. Our dissolved oxygen is 8.7 parts per million. So is this enough to support a range of fish? Should be. You know, that's kind of right in the sweet spot, right in the middle. Um, our temperature is 81.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 
pretty warm, to be honest, but we still have a fair amount of oxygen, so um, we should be okay. Um, and we're gonna see what comes up in the net. A lot, <laughs> so we got a lot in that net, a nice bit of diversity. We got white perch, mama chug, pipefish, which we saw a picture of with that wonderful little mouth that's very pointy. And we got a hog choker, winter flounder, northern kingfish, sea robin. I'm going to show you some pictures of these so you don't have to wonder what they all look like. But I just wanted to point out that we had a, quite a range of diversity in what we pulled in. We also got a mama chug, which we mentioned was marsh loving, right? Um, and we also got a flounder, a winter flounder. So again, a little marsh lover. So we got several species that seem to be very happy in this environment. Um, and then we had a couple that were actually not fish, and I pointed them out up here. These are little macroinvertebrates. We have a small juvenile crab. This is a little female from the belly. So the belly has this kind of whiter apron down here. Um, and we have some uh, grass shrimp, palamentes. Okay, so we're sampling for diversity. We're not sampling for abundance. So how would our recording sheet be different if we wanted to sample for abundance? What do you guys think? Again, these are good questions to ask your students to see if they can uh, think a little bit and see um, how to set up a study sample. Anybody wanna pop in and tell us how, how it would be different if we were looking at abundance? Right, so we would want to add the number of species. So the number and the size would be great. So size is actually um, telling us a little bit more about um, how old the species might be. So are we looking at very young of the year um, uh, uh, fish samples or are we looking at more mature fish? Um, all of these things would be really important. Um, and again, we would, if we wanted to record abundance, what might we learn from that? So what, what might we learn from abundance, aside from just how many fish are sitting there? So Marissa has written down the number of fish to compare population size. Um, could be, uh, it's hard to do that from just single sampling. So we would have to really do a lot of sampling to get a better sense of that. And of course, because we're only able to sample a small subset of what's in the river, that also can be a little bit um, confusing or difficult. But it would tell us about, um, some of our fish might be schooling fish. So for example, we get, oh, interesting, another thought here. But we will get, when we uh, will run our net through the water, um, and we didn't get any Atlantic silver sides in our net here, but that, in fact, um, we get hundreds of them sometimes, anything from 50 to 100. Um, and that's because they're a little school, they're a small fish, a feeder fish, and they school. So they work in a large group to kind of protect each other. Um, whereas, um, and they also like kind of an open setting, whereas some of these um, other fish like a striped bass, um, they are not as apt to go in, you know, they might be more single predators. Okay, so we're gonna keep moving on. Um, and if we recorded the size, what might we learn? And we've already talked about that because somebody brought that up, which was great. Okay, so next we're gonna look at the fish, uh, their salinity tolerances. So um, I have put together a list that says salty, brackish, or fresh, and we're going to go to uh, the next page and look at that. Um, so with a salinity of 8.1 part per thousand, what letter letters might we expect to see by every fish? What do you think? Yep, okay, so somebody said B and uh, that would be our brackish. And absolutely, that would be my expectation too. So let's see what we've got. Um, so if you look at this is 
part of our catch. We had so many fish, I wanted to be able to let you look at them in all their glory. So we have this beautiful pipe fish that um, Laurel showed a picture of earlier. She showed more than mouths. I wanted you to see its, it's wonderful um, body and it's, it's really beautiful fin structure. Um, this is a hog choker. So hog chokers are a, a flat fish. Um, they are not born that way. Their eyes migrate as they get a little older. And so a flatfish, um, we could assume right off the bat, where would they live? Well, they would live right on the bottom. And that's where they spend their time uh, feeding on the bottom of the river and kind of bury themselves in the sediments down at the base of the river. And we have a variety of those in the Hudson. Um, and just below that, we have the winter flounder, which is another flatfish that hangs out in the benthic region. Um, earlier this, I guess earlier this month, um, there, uh, the fisheries guys uh, collected another one, a northern uh, stargazer, which also buries in the, in the bottom of the river. So there are several. Um, we have a mummachug, which we mentioned was the uh, marsh a mud minnow and the marsh lover. Um, so again, both the flounder and the mummachug like those marshy environments. We have this beautiful northern kingfish. Isn't it pretty, the colorations on that? And the northern kingfish has a little barbel right down on its chin. Very hard to see, but it does have one. So it has that wonderful feature. Um, and then here's our white perch, which we've seen a picture of before that has that lateral line. So each of these has B as part of their name, but some of them have um, brackish to fresh, and some of them have salty to brackish. So we see that we're spanning this range in the fish that we have. And then moving on to our next group of fish, we have this lovely young striped bass. Um, and our, we have a couple of fish here that are actually extremely tolerant in that they can go salty to brackish to fresh. So they have quite a range. Um, and in many, most instances, that means that they are a migratory fish. So our striped bass will move through the water, likes to get up to the freshwater to spawn. Um, our American eel is an opposite. So they're, um, the striped bass is anadromous, moving from salty to fresh to spawn. And our American eel is catadromous. So it moves from salty uh, goes, moves from fresh to salty to spawn, and then it's young of the year moved back into the river system. So they use the full extent of the estuary, which is kind of cool. Um, the bluefish is a mighty predator. It's a salty to brackish. Our menhaden is one that I mentioned that we had that were very susceptible earlier this season. We lost a lot to um, low oxygen levels. They are also salty to brackish, so they spawn actually out in the ocean, and then their young of the year come into the harbor and the lower estuary to um, uh, spend a little bit of time before heading back into the big bad ocean to brave the predators there. Um, and then we have this wonderful little sea robin, and sea robin are really interesting fish in that um, some of their spines have actually transitioned into something that looks a little bit like legs, so they look as if they run along the bottom of the um, Hudson when you see them move. It's kind of a fascinating adaptation. And then the uh, blue crab again spans the whole estuary or is able to span the whole estuary and our grassy shrimp is uh, salty to brackish. So we put them all in a grid and here is where we can do um, a little bit of um, fun activity with you guys. So have you guys used um, the uh, feature where you can actually annotate on Zoom. Are you familiar with annotating? So if you go up to annotate, it will give you a little stamp uh, or color text, whatever. Um, and we thought it might be fun to kind of go through and we can annotate this. Now it might be easier, I guess, if just one of us annotates and uh, you guys let us know where they should go. Um, but I'm open to whatever you would like to do. So. Um, Laura, what do you think makes the most sense? I'm showing you how this works, by the way. So you can just do that and annotate and then there's an eraser and you can erase. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, it would, if you aren't familiar with the annotate feature on Zoom, it'd be fun for you all to mess around with it just so you um, have that tool kind of in your toolbox. Um, but we can also add it for you. Um, so 
So there are six different stamps on mine. I don't know if other people have different stamps, but um, what we could do is, so I'm gonna pick a blue heart stamp and I'm going to, or a red, sorry, a red heart stamp and write white perch. Now white perch is brackish and fresh. So I would put that feature right here in my Venn diagram because that overlaps between brackish and fresh. Okay, where is this tool? It's if you um, look at your toolbar, um, at the top, it, it comes up with annotate. So at the and top, it will say you are viewing Margie Turin's screen. Um, next to that, it says view options. You click on that and you go down to annotate. Ooh, and then somebody's on it. Toolbar will pop up. Perfect. So you can have text, you can draw, you can do stamps, arrows. Um, We've used it this summer with our interns and they have a blast with it. <laughs> Great, so you might want, yep. Okay, so Stripe Bass. Somebody seems to have put Stripe Bash in Brackish Fresh maybe, um, but Stripe Bass spans all, yeah, that's where I'd like to see it. Okay, cool. And you can, um, I think you can change the color on these stamps, although we should have tested that out maybe, huh? I think I can, so, um, nope, mm -mm. that one's gonna be red too, so maybe it needs two hearts to be a pipefish. How does that sound? <laughs> we'll put them right on top of each other. So we don't see anything that's just salty and we don't see anything that's just brackish and we don't have anything in the um, just fresh category. So you can see that we're very tightly clustered around these overlapping pieces of our Venn diagram, which is um, a really important, I think, takeaway from this particular um, set of data is that everything is kind of clustered in um, in an area where we can move between a couple of different um, environments. All right, so everybody's got the gist of this and you see how you can use it. Now, the other, of course, opportunity for you as teachers is that you could um, send this to your students in advance. They could be working on a worksheet and they could be annotating um, or doing this um, along with you or on their own and share it back and just show it, take a picture and share it back. Um, any of those are options. And I know you guys are probably way more in tune with how to do that than I am. So I won't waste time um, going through it all. So I'm gonna clear this. Um, great job, thanks for that. I'm gonna clear all drawings, Whee, and away we go. Okay, um, so we're gonna keep going. We have now finished in BZAC. Whoops, I thought I'd finished. <laughs> oh, you have to click on the mouse again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wait. I have to click on the mouse. Gotcha. Okay, good. All right, I'm not finished apparently. Um, okay, so now we're moving on to Croton Point Park. And so we're going to start with the environment. So that was River Mile 18, where we were originally. We're now at River Mile 35. So we've moved, oh, you know, a few miles upriver. Um, and uh, we are in a very different environment. This is an area called Mother's Lap Beach. It's a very open sandy beach. There isn't a marsh here and the water is kind of slow moving because you can see it's cut off from the main channel. So it's a really nice um, quiet environment for us to check out the fish. So we're going to start in. So again, we're moving away from the Atlantic Ocean. So you can see that our salinity is different. It was 8.1 when we were further down in um, Yonkers. So now we're about half of that. So um, much less salty. Um, our dissolved oxygen is 11.0 um, parts per million. So that's a really nice range, right? So remember our five to 11 is what we're interested in. So we should expect that we can support a decent fish population here. Temperatures are still warm. I wouldn't, I'm not that surprised. I expect that the temperatures are probably going to be fairly consistent. And we have this wonderful sandy beach. 
So we are going to go seining and see what we find. So not as many species in this particular environment. Um, we have pipefish, which um, anybody remember any of these from the, have we caught any of these before? So we have pipefish, we have juvenile herring, bluefish, striped bass. You can type in anything you remember from the last time. White perch, spottail shiner, Atlantic menhaden, or grass shrimp. Anybody remember anything that we might have seen? Ah, so Jody says, all except the shiner. Um, striped bass, white perch, shrimp from Donna, bluefish from Mary Lee, striped bass, um, pipefish. So yeah, a lot of these we did actually see in the, um, in the last and not the herring too. Okay, Jody, I'm glad you added that. <laughs> so yeah, a lot of these that we did actually see in the last go around, which is not too surprising because if you remember, we had that salty brackish overlap for quite a few of these species. And I did wanna point out, Laurel showed this image actually before or an image of this particular fish before. And this is the spot tail shiner. And it has that little um, spot on its back, which it can use to confuse its predators. Um, so this is a very cool fish for those of us who uh, work on the Hudson River because it was first identified here actually by a governor, Governor Clinton, um, way back in the 1800s. Um, it's interesting to think of our fishermen as our, our governors as being fishermen, but many of them are and have been. In fact, even uh, Pataki was uh, a, a big sport fishing fisherman. Um, and so he named it after the Hudson. So its Latin name is Natropus Hudsonius. So nice. If you catch that, um, it's a fun thing to share. <coughs> okay, we're going to move on to the next. Oh, I'm sorry. And I did want to point out that. Um, Juvenile herring, remember we talked about how menhaden were sensitive to low dissolved oxygen levels. Again, I just wanna point out that dissolved oxygen levels are important to our herring population. So here we're at a healthy 11 parts per million, and that's gonna be a really nice uh, oxygen level for this particular species, but it's definitely paying attention to oxygen. All right, so here we have this group. We have um, a little bit of a difference. So now we have, um, Again, some that are uh, salty to brackish, some that span the entire estuary like our striped bass. Um, but we have these two new species that showed up that um, Jody called out specifically. And that was this juvenile herring and this spot tail shiner, both of which we would classify as more freshwater fish, which is kind of interesting, right? So um, does that surprise anybody? So it might, because we are thinking of um, the fact that this, this area is actually brackish. It's not a freshwater um, specifically environment. Um, but fish have preferred environments and then they have tolerances and they swim around and that salt level in the Hudson actually moves. It's not stable. So it doesn't just stay at one particular spot in the river all the time. It moves depending on how much rain we've had, um, how much um, ice melt we've had after the end of the winter and the spring. So the fact that that salt kind of moves around means that the fish are also a little bit adaptable in this area, some less than others, but these guys seem to um, be able to kind of take a hint of salt in their environment. Okay, so again, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna resort to our annotation. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to go ahead and annotate this because I think it's a very visual way of seeing how this particular uh, fish catch might vary from the last one. You guys are getting right into this now. <laughs> Perfect. So we can see that um, we have fewer species to actually try and, and locate and log. Um, we have these two 
that, um, well, actually, we just have one, like two different markers, but our striped bass is the only one that really spans this entire um, stretch of salty brackish fresh that we've collected here in Croton. Um, we have two that are completely fresh. So um, we have our juvenile herring and our spot tail shiner. And then the rest of them um, should be kind of stacking up in the uh, salty to brackish. So in this particular section right here. And that's in fact what we found. So great stuff. I'm going to go ahead and clear. Mouse again. Okay, and we're at our last site. This is our beacon site. It's River Mile 61. And our beacon site is a completely different environment. Um, there's no marsh, but you can see this incredible plant uh, forest. Like it just this huge bed of plants. Um, these are an invasive plant called uh, Trapanatans, which is a water chestnut plant. Um, it comes from Eurasia and it likes these freshwater um, kind of side channel, quiet environments. Uh, it forms incredible dense mats on the surface of the water and it starves the water below of oxygen, which can make it very difficult for us to find fish. When we got there, we were really surprised at how impacted this area was with those plants. You can see our colleague is trying to wade out into the plants to try and get a measure of the water quality from underneath the plant bed. So he's looking at um, oxygen levels, salinity, et cetera, um, down in underneath the plant beds. So again, we would wanna make sure that we recorded this in our environment because this is going to impact whatever fish we're gonna find here. And you can see that salinity wise, we have just a trace amount of salt, which we would consider fresh water. Um, our oxygen levels are actually different depending on where we took them. Inside that plant bed, they were as low as 3.3 parts per million. So it was completely uh, blocking out any photosynthesis from occurring. And so whatever was happening on the surface of the water, the oxygen was being shot back up into the atmosphere and the water below was really being depleted of oxygen. But just outside the bed, we got a reading of 5.6 parts per million. Again, low, fairly low, but, um, but it's at least in that range that can support our, our fish population. So um, five to 11, if you'll remember. Um, our water temperatures were 81.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so we decided not to fish in the plant bed. Um, I suppose you could figure out why we decided not to fish in the plant bed with oxygen levels of that uh, low amount. We would not have uh, felt that we would be successful in terms of trying to run, uh, collect fish under there. In addition, of course, it's a pretty dense mat, very difficult to maneuver in. I don't know that we would have been successful at trying to uh, run a net through that environment and really do anything except to cause ourselves grief as we tangled ourselves up in it. Okay, so we're gonna see what we caught here. Um, and what we caught here was a banded killi, a tessellated darter, spot tail shiner, striped bass, those amazingly hardy striped bass, and we caught a juvenile American eel. So um, interesting, right? Um, so what do we know about herring that might make it hard for them in this spot? You notice we didn't get any herring. First site where we haven't gotten any herring. What do you guys think? Yep, they need a lot of DO and there just isn't enough to support them. So uh, again, you know, this is not a surprise that we didn't get any herring. Um, and so now what letter do you think we might expect to find by every fish in this salinity? And again, you know, these are just good things. Yep, F for fresh. And these are just good things to help with your students to just help them stay focused on why we're doing what we're doing here. So yes, we do find an F beside every single fish. 
Um, you can see the banded killi. This is a picture that Laurel showed already and um, this beautiful marking on this banded killi. We've seen the spot tail shiner. We've seen all these guys except this really pretty little tessellated darter um, that's down here on the bottom. Um, and uh, definitely a freshwater fish. All right, so last time, let's see if we can uh, go ahead and, and get marking. Wow, is somebody already on this or did that uh, linger over from the last time? <laughs> Maybe it lingered from last time. We already have a green check. Mm. Thank you. Okay, good. We shouldn't have any in that salty brackish. We should be hanging out either in just the um, salty brackish fresh or all fresh. So great job. Um, perfect. I'm going to clear that, but you can see how our Venn diagrams have changed um, as we've moved through this. So that's kind of a, a fun way of, of exploring this. Okay, so if you wanted to, you could go onto the next page and I'll just show you what it looks like, but we have all of the fish that we caught with the different salinities with, um, oops, we have another lingering mark down here. Okay, great. Um, so we have all the salinities, et cetera. Um, if we're not gonna actually do the marking because I think that we can do the activities without getting into, uh, again, continuing to do the marking, but um, we're going to look for uh, any species that were caught in all three locations, okay? So what's our strategy to do that? It's going to be to look for all three of those initials. So for your students, especially if you're teaching a young student body, you know, that would be the strategy you would want to set them up with so that they know um, where we're going. So we're going to look at any species that was caught in all three locations. And then um, one of our species was caught at Bezac and again at Beacon, but not at Croton. So we're gonna look for that species. And then we're gonna think about the fact, do you think the species is also at Croton? Do you think it could be successful at Croton? And why you might answer that. So um, for students, sometimes they have a hard time with thinking about things might be there even though they weren't caught in that specific location. Um, but the idea that we would be able to find a species in Bezac and then find it again up at Beacon means that it's gotta be moving through the system, that it's tolerant of these different environments. So it would stand to reason that it exists in Croton. Again, just the idea that we're not catching everything that's there, we're only catching a subset. So we're gonna look for these two different species. One, any that were caught in all three locations and any that were caught at just Bezac and Beacon. So see if you can figure that out for us. So what did we catch at all three locations? Striped bass. Our striped bass, that's right, okay. And what was it that we um, actually caught, yeah, at, at just um, Bezac and Beacon? The elver, the American eel, exactly. And so if we look at that eel, we can see that it has salinity that can tolerate salty, brackish, fresh. So certainly we would expect that it would be throughout the river. Um, we just didn't pull it up in our nets at that particular location. Um, and again, you know, if you were splitting this up over different days, you could do different parts of this, and then you might wanna do something with these questions um, on a separate day and allow the students to actually do some annotating with this final one. Um, it, I'm gonna clear all this and we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, so let's think back about some of our catches. So what do you think is the reason we found mama chugs at Bezac but nowhere else? It's more 
Hmm. So we heard, I've heard um, a thought of salinity. Is there anything else that, ah, Grace said it likes marshes. Yes. So it actually is a, a marsh loving fish. Um, it's more of a brackish freshwater um, species, but it really likes that marshy environment. So the fact that we had that wonderful environment in Bezac made it feel like home for that particular species. Um, what's one reason we might not have found herring and beacon? Low oxygen, exactly right. So we know that they're sensitive. They need that lovely level of oxygen. So we had pretty marginal oxygen levels in beacons. So that would have dictated that. Um, we didn't uh, catch hog chokers in Croton, yet they're listed as brackish fresh. Does that mean there are no hog chokers in that part of the river? What do you think? Jody, I don't understand what you mean when you said did not do a sample. I don't know if you want to clarify that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Maybe we didn't just sample robustly enough. So, and I, I would hesitate to say robustly enough because there are a lot of factors um, that can come into play when you're sampling. Um, it could be that some species like to be in certain locations at different times of the year and then they move to different areas. Um, I don't think if we sampled incredibly robustly, we would ever find everything that's in a specific location in the river. It's just there, there are, you know, over 200 species of fish in the Hudson, many, many types of fish that um, are like specific preferences. Um, the brackish fish are the most uh, resilient because they can move between fresh and salt and kind of have to move around. Um, so, you know, that, that can have a factor, but it definitely doesn't mean that they weren't in this other part of the river. Um, why do you think freshwater fish might have been found where there was a little salt in the water? And we actually did talk about this, the fact that the salt moves in the system. In fact, the salt moves with the tides. So as the tides come in, we get more salt in the system. And as the tides move out, we have less salt, especially at the front end of the salt. And so, if we were towards the front end of the salt, we might have um, just caught the fish there um, at, at a tidal change. So again, um, they are able to tolerate, it's just not their preference. Um, what surprises did you notice in the fish catches? Was there any surprise in the fish catch? I think to me, it was interesting how many more fish were in the um, BZAC saying than in the others. So that might, that was a little bit interesting to me. Um, but uh, again, and somebody said pipefish was all there. So that there were pipefish um, in a couple of locations, which was nice. Surprised how far the striped bass would move to find food. Oh yeah, those striped bass are all over the river. Um, and cool to catch elvers, absolutely. So Mary Lee catches, catches little young of the year eels with us annually. And you're absolutely right, it is cool to catch elvers. Um, Bezac is one location that we find a lot of eel, especially uh, elver age eel. So that, um, that's kind of a, a fun place to go if you like the eel. Um, and then we just sampled diversity at three sites on the Hudson. If we'd stayed at Bezac, what type of fish would we not have expected to find? And again, these are just good kind of wrap up questions to go back to with your students to make sure that they kind of think through the whole loop. Exactly, we would not have expected to find those freshwater species. Um, so there are some herring in the, so the menhaden, but you're right, those young of the year herring are um, more often found in a freshwater environment. Yeah, that's, so that was right. Okay, so for a fish or species to live in a range of different salinities, it has to be extremely adaptable. Um, do you remember two that were caught in this event that seemed to be fairly adaptable? Yep, 
So the striped bass and the elver. And by the way, I'm hitting on a lot of things that probably seem repetitive to you all, but I'm just giving you different options of questions and things that when we share this PowerPoint, you'll have some of these and you can kind of sift through and organize in any way that you want in terms of using or, um, you know, weeding through. Um, so we're working with data from a one day trip in the river. Um, but let's think about if we worked at, at BZAC or we were a school that was right by BZAC and we wanted to go every day and same for a week, like in June, um, would we expect to collect the same kinds of things every day? Would we expect a similar assortment of fish? What do you guys think? Okay, so we see it might change with temperatures as DO levels change, absolutely. I think similar, but not exactly the same. Um, most probably, uh, if fish migrate from one area to another, it might change. Uh, no, we sample an area several times in a day and do not get the same sampling due to tides. Excellent point. So yes, we get um, what hour of the day. So things change in the rivers. So that's one of the wonderful things about working on the Hudson. It is dynamic. It is not the same anytime you put your net in the water. We would expect to find a similar complement of fish in a specific part of the river, as long as things are, it's not some strangely anomalous situation. Um, but strangely enough, we have found saltwater fish all the way up at Norrie Point, which is River Mile 84, when there's been an, you know, an incredible um, wind event, which has put, pushed the tides way up. So you can find different things in different areas, which is why it's so important to record what we call that metadata. So the environment, uh, we, we asked already for salinity, dissolved oxygen and temperature, but if there'd been a storm event or some unusual event happening around your sampling, that again would be something really important to take note of. So great stuff. Okay. Um, so we have a website that has a variety of um, materials and lesson plans and data on it. It's part of um, the Day in the Life of the Hudson and Harbor project that we run in, in concert with the DEC. And um, this is the link for that. Uh, it has got all kinds of information on the parameters. It's got all kinds of information um, on sampling that's been done. And we will be running uh, this program this year. If you haven't already signed up, uh, we encourage you to do that. It will be virtual this year. So uh, we'll be doing some pre and post visits with schools. We'll also be then um, sharing data at different locations on the river. The students will still have a chance to work with the data. So it'll be a little different than our norm, but it'll still be a wonderful experience with um, uh, the science as well as with the Hudson and a chance to really dig in and let the students be scientists and work with other students on the river, which is the fun piece. We also, as Laurel mentioned earlier, have this wonderful field station. This is our website and um, we encourage you to come visit us there. We've been running a lot of programs over the summer with a group of students who have been helping to develop some materials and we'll be putting those online as well. So that'll be another fun opportunity for you all. Um, to uh, dig into some other resources with us. And I think at this point, we wanna quickly um, get you guys to do one more Mentimeter so that we can see what's changed. So Laurel put the link in the chat and um, we'll ask you to go there. And again, three words that come to mind when you think about fish. I'm glad it was helpful. We, we love hosting you and having you. We would love to have you at the field station, um, but any way that we can be helpful with anything about the Hudson or fish, we're here to help. This is what we love to do, so. And um, I'm sorry, we do have these other two workshops. So tomorrow we'll be talking about habitat. Um, so the different habitats in the Hudson and um, it's, Focus more on middle school, but I, I think that you could certainly take information out that could be useful if you're working with younger students than that. 
And then on Wednesday, we'll be looking at a couple of migra migratory species and kind of doing more in the way of um, kind of uh, graphs and interpreting data. And that's geared a more towards high school. Yeah, thank you, Laura. I forgot that part. <laughs> Does everybody have, oh, I can stop sharing because you guys probably have the URL already. Um, but we like to look at what comes back. So how are we doing? We have 12 people. I'll just share it for now. So you guys can kind of watch along. Um, so water's still pretty big, but there are other words that are pretty big as well. So more diverse, which is great. So adaptable, adaptive, Ooh, fascinating gills. Um, adaptations, beautiful, I love that, colorful, dissolved oxygen, tail diverse, swim bladder, benthic. So uh, it looks like a lot of new words um, than the first one, and we can just compare real quick. Um, yeah, so I think there were like three big ones, and this one has much more like larger words of, that are more diverse than what the first one had shown. So that's really great. So there are a couple of questions that came in. Um, one is, I'm assuming our trip in October is canceled. And um, Deborah, we have not been able to be at the field station and host anyone. Columbia has not opened um, that resource. Um, so our expectation is that we probably won't be able to host um, at the field station, but we're happy to work with your students and do a virtual uh, trip if that would be useful. So follow up with us if you would please um, and Laurel do you know if there are any apps about fish anatomy pictures of species Ooh, apps about fish I can't think of any off the top of my head um, my favorite nature app which I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with is iNaturalist I just use it all the time whenever I'm like hiking or outside looking at the Hudson and I see something that I don't know, you just take a picture with your phone um, using the app and it identifies it for you from like crowdsourcing of a bunch of other people. Um, yep, Yanis, that's it. iNaturalist. Mm -hmm. It's free. It's really great. Um, I, but that's not really specific on fish anatomy. I can't think of one. Um, but if I think of anything, I can always uh, let Nina know. We can provide it in the sources. Someone said seek. I'm not sure what seek is, but oh, I haven't maybe. heard of that either. Okay, Deborah, do you want to talk about it? What do you, can you give us some input? Um, I have that on my Google phone. It's the same as iNaturalist. Oh, okay. All right. So also non-specific to fish, but still very helpful in terms of doing ID. And in fact, those of you who have done Day in the Life with us will know that fish ID is one of our biggest challenges. And we have worked um, really, we actually refined a lot of our data sheets this year, not realizing we were not going to be doing our normal event. Um, but we talked about actually having people use iNaturalists in the field because we thought it would be a big help in terms of trying to tease out some of the challenges. Cool. Great. Are there any other questions? Um, if there aren't, thank you everyone so much for joining us. I do want to say if you do have any questions in the future, um, you can feel free to email Cassie and we will make sure that Margie and Laurel get them and get back to you. Um, and then we're also, we've been recording this session, so we are going to be sending it out uh, with some other resources that we are working on right now. So hopefully that will help you guys bring Fish and the Hudson River into your classroom. Um, and you guys can, if you have any feedback about the session or anything like that, if you want to send that over, that'd be wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone.